let's get this started. Uh, my name is J.R. Logan, and I'm the executive director of Make Haven. I see a lot of members, but for those of you who may not be members, uh, welcome as well. Uh, this is part of a whole line of these sort of ideation or innovation sessions that we've done. Uh, we've looked for uh, mostly government agencies, but it, has, it could be others, who have put out a call for innovation. Often there's a prize. In this case, there are several prizes. And uh, we try and break it down and uh, have a conversation about what the challenge is so that if people do want to submit a uh, response to it, uh, they're in a better place to do so. Uh, so essentially our job right now is to make sure you understand it, connect you with people, and uh, if you choose to take it further, you can, but you're absolutely under no obligation to do so. Uh, the presentation um, that I'm gonna do is about the Civic Innovation Challenge, which has two tracks. And I will start my presentation now. So this, uh, this challenge actually has a significant prize award. Uh, it's being done in combination. The National Science Foundation is the leader in this one, uh, but it's being supported by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, as well as the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, in the first round, there's two rounds or two stages. Uh, they give $50,000 for planning. And then in the second one, you get the full award in order to do some sort of implementation of a pilot project. And uh, I'll go through and read some of the language specific that they use, but they want something that is real life, but also has a research element. So you've got to remember this is coming from the Nat National uh, Science Foundation. And so research is their starting point. And my reading of it is they're trying to open it up more widely to a broader spectrum of people that can do research. So uh, here, here are their stated goals. Uh, so what they wanna do is they wanna flip the dynamic so that uh, communities are identifying the civic priorities that are ripe for innovation uh, and then partnering with researchers who can help to bring those into reality. Uh, they want to focus on real world problems that can be tested in a time scale of one year, uh, where a lot of the types of programs that they're working on are uh, in a much bigger time scale. And their emphasis is really on civic engagement. So they have a requirement that you work with a civic partner, whether that's a nonprofit, uh, government agency, uh, or, or uh, academic institution. I believe if you're working if you are submitting as an academic institution, you also have to have a nonprofit or government entity uh, working with you. And as this program goes along, those that are successful are gonna get a bunch of uh, support in the form of facilitating collaboration across different sites. So of the two track, we're getting some background noise from somebody. Lior, if you could help me just with the muting. Um, We will mute there. Okay. Uh, the program has two stages, uh, as I talked about. There's the $50,000, and how they describe what you're going to be doing in that first stage is solidifying a team, uh, solidifying academic and civic partners, um, strengthening collaboration. Uh, uh, finding relevant stakeholders, refining the vision, uh, making plans to execute, maturing project plans, uh, preparing to submit a full proposal. So even if you get that first planning grant of $50,000, the activities that they anticipate really are to bring it together. Uh, so you wanna have something that's strong, I think, and that has uh, partners identified that are, are good partners that you could, you've begun the conversation, the relationship with, uh, but it doesn't need to be a, a fait complete. doesn't need to be complete. Uh, and then the second uh, phase of pilot project could be up to a million dollars uh, over that 12 months. And I haven't gotten into all of the various specifics, but I expect that includes uh, paying for the staffing and the, the, the work to actually complete that project. 
Uh, and that would be uh, the nonprofit partner would be the one that uh, actually takes on the grant and administers it. This is not a grant uh, to the person. Uh, the, uh, the resilience to natural disasters, a track that we are talking about at this, this moment. Uh, and I'm going to read through, I've gone and tried to make it a little easier to parse by highlighting some things, but I want to read through their description because everything we do after this is based on whether we're answering the description they give us. And there's a, there's a, a couple of slides here. So, so every year, natural disasters and extreme weather events affect millions of Americans. Many communities across the United States have struggled to adapt to the increasing frequency and severity of events which demand robust and resilient response for rapid recovery. Research demonstrates that negative impacts of disasters disproportionately affect vulnerable communities with lower incomes. This track supports sensor decision technologies that can prepare communities to respond to extreme weather and other events such as flooding, hurricanes, wildfires, and heat waves. The goal of the track is to answer questions, including but not limited to, how can community, communities and researchers work together to do place-based, data-driven, community resilience indicators, so this is the science part, uh, as interventions that will better enable residents, businesses to prepare, respond to, and recover from flooding and other natural disasters. I'll, I'll ad lib and say, I watched the webinar and they said they count uh, COVID and pandemics as a type of natural disaster. This was written before the pandemic. How can these indicators be developed through integrating data sets using novel approaches, measuring resistance, unlocking creative interventions to build resistance? What roles and new technologies and new roles do people play in these approaches, including sensor data, real-time data, uh, collection analysis, data integration, and privacy methods? What civic, uh, what are, and civic engagement te techniques? How can communities lever leverage real-time data technologies, civic engagement uh, to mitigate the risk of natural disaster. What applicability do these indicators have on resilience? How can these uh, indicators relate to community systems, infrastructure, transportation, water, energy? How do those system enhance business resilience? Teams in this track should understand, uh, take deep community engagement, uh, reaching to underrepresented vulnerable communities, approaching uh, should consider how to collect the data and inform and involve the people that are uh, collecting those indicators and how those indicators affect them. Teams should consider how residents can use these indicators uh, to build resistance within the communities. Finally, teams should propose and pilot interventions that can boost community resilience. The intervention should draw on civic engagement, innovation, innovative use of sensors, decision algorithms, and other tools that help prepare communities to respond. All right, so that's a, it's a little painful but I think it was worth going through because it uh, it really drives home that uh, the things that they've repeated and that they they wanted. Uh, I I heard sensors, data, indicators, civic engagement uh, in doing that and involvement. Those were the big highlights, and they had uh, they said sensors, but they also said creative engagements, which to me means that there's a big bucket. Uh, that can that things can go into. In a moment, you're going to hear from Aisha, who is uh, the head of the city plan in New Haven. But before we got uh, the ideas from her about what the problems would be, I wanted you guys just to volunteer and list some problems that you uh, you think might be worthy of solutions related to disaster response. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna list them here. So we have them, you can put them in the chat and I will uh, put them in front of everybody. So chat or, or you can unmute and let me know. I'm gonna call on, I'm gonna call on Carrie who works on um, uh, Connecticut Fund for the Environment. You guys have to work with uh, resilience and sustainability water, those sorts of things. Can you give me an example of the type of problem that people might want to solve related to disaster? Uh, yeah, sure. So you could have um, coastal flooding, inland flooding, um, extreme heat. 
And in those situations, um, when you have coastal flooding, how do things break down? Where could um, data potentially come into play? So maybe uh, flooding warning systems or where flooding happens, knowing where flooding happens over time? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. I, I don't know if this is as big of an issue in New Haven, but um, knowing if like neighborhoods are cut off, if roads are cut off, um, I guess, yeah, if trees fall down in the middle of the road, uh, knowing um, in real time where all that's happening. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for, thanks for the first, feel free to pipe in more. Others that have yeah. thoughts about what might might be related to uh, problems when a natural disaster comes. Rich, I'm sure you have something to say about communication. No, Lior, maybe you have something to say about uh, other things. I think Rich had a, had a chat. Oh, he has a chat. No power cables, uh, cell phone towers, uh, and community um, communications. So. Okay, I got it. Uh, yep. I couldn't find uh, my enable my microphone button. Yeah, that's all right. The chat actually right. works really well. Anyway, so, so uh, we're going to say uh, lack of communication. So if there's uh, no power, so that means a lot of technology is down. If there's no cell technology available, that means you're not going to be able to use your cell phone. And how does a civil, a civic community communicate its deeds and its emergencies? And I have a solution. But, well, no solutions yet. We're not, okay. we're not allowed to do that yet. We're just talking right. about the problems. All right. I'm, I'm muting myself now. Yep. So uh, are there other problems that come to mind? Things that, give me one related to the pandemic. Uh, what was a problem that happened? So I just yeah, Jr. Oh, sorry. <laughs> nope. Go for it. Um, yeah, I was going to uh, chime in on that. So um, I don't know how much sensors are going to help with this, but I know one of the primary problems for the pandemic was sort of resource allocation, um, knowing where the PPE was, who had what, where it should be delivered, where it was most needed. Mm -hmm. And Lior, you were going to say something. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm still just struggling a little bit with exactly what they're asking for. So I'm just going to try to like restate the question a little bit uh, just to make sure on the same page. So they're, they're looking for a proposition for sensors that could either predict or help respond to natural disasters and figuring out how those sensors could be could could facilitate either the the identification or the response. So is, is that, is that well, kind of so about? sensors is one of the, the things. They say oh, okay. um, decision technologies, which is their word for sensors, and then they say mm -hmm. sensor and decision technology. So the way I am looking at it is it's uh, the back end analysis or decision technology that can help people communicate and make a decision, or it's the sensor data that we're pulling from the community. And then they had the big uh, grab bag, which was uh, unlocking creative interventions, right? So I think creative yeah. interventions that build resistance is a generic, um, a generic enough bucket that we can be broader. Yeah. So I think something that Carrie said that, um, I mean, there's just slightly a riff on, but maybe like a vibration sensor that could figure oh, is out. Is this a solution point. or a problem? Uh, We're only doing problems so, at this point. So, all right. Well, okay. Then you can save it. You can save it for later if you have a solution. No, I, th I well, okay. I'll just, I'll save the solution, but I think the problem perhaps, I don't even know if this is really a problem is not knowing if the road is passable, which I feel like could be a, a problem in any number of natural disasters. Uh, and we could have, and so knowing whether or not a road is passable and being able to see that on a map could be, could be beneficial a lot of the times. I like to add something to this. Um, a human being 
could with uh, could be a sensor reporting uh, reporting. <laughs> Well, you're talking about sensors, and I, what I'm trying yeah, to do yeah, is, well, as long as it's a problem, I'm, I'm yeah. trying to, I'm trying to, uh, yeah, it's a problem to think of sensors as being just a technological instrument sensing a variable. A human being could be a sensor who is reporting a variety of uh, what they see and what they hear into aggregated database, and that then becomes a much more robust sets of uh, information for decision making. So a human so, being could be a sensor if they report in what they see in here. I'm going to say that doesn't sound like a problem to me. I'm going to rephrase that as sensors are not mobile. Well, how about sensors can be humans? Well, that, we'll, we'll keep going. Uh, I right. want to make sure that we start with problems because we're going to get to solutions, technical solutions to those problems later. Okay. Uh, food security was said in comments. And access to essential services. Uh, yeah, so service access. All right. So I think we have a good set of problems. Yeah, I would just, JR, I would change the extreme heat to extreme temperature because we should be talking about ice as well. Yep. Can I jump right. in and add one more, JR? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, like displacement, like a lot, uh, some people will have, if their home gets flooded out or they're displaced for whatever reason, some people will have places to go, but some people won't. Um, I think we're seeing that right now a little bit with hotels being used for homeless shelters. And, I think, so. Great. So now what I want you to do is I'm going to time it. I want you to take two minutes, a minute and a half, and on a pen or notepad, silently to yourself, I want you to write down as many solutions as you can. They can be crazy. Uh, and just write them down on a piece of paper so that we can talk about them later. So uh, I'll leave this up so you can see what the problems are. Just try and write as many solutions as possible. All right, that's um, about it. So if you have any last ideas. Great. I want you to hold on to those. If you get other ideas that queue uh, as you're hearing the presentation, please add them to your list. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is I wanted to, we want to rely on expertise, but it's we wanted to get your ideas out before you hear from experts, uh, because sometimes that can limit or bound what your creativity is. Um, and so with that, I want to turn it over to Aisha. I'm gonna stop uh, presenting. And Aisha, are you there? Hi, I'm here. Right. I just found my mic icon. Yep, that would be great. Uh, so so Thanks so much, JR. Um, I didn't I didn't realize how fun this was going to be. 
I, I love the pace of it. And um, I, I promise I will not be um, so expert as to curtail any creative ideas that you might be having. Um, because actually I'm, I'm not an expert. Um, and we also like to say in city plan, there are no emergencies in planning. Um, but uh, having said that, um, I think um, planning is fundamentally about resilience. And um, it really, when you have these kinds of disasters, then you really realize where your weak points in your kind of long range planning are. It really like lays bare where the issues are. Um, so just as a, um, a little background, um, some of my, um, Inspiration really comes from um, Judith Rodin's model of resilience cities. Um, that's from a few years ago, but she talks about the shocks and the stressors. I think we're talking about shocks today, but it's really the stressors that determine the outcomes of the shocks, even more than the sort of the um, emergency preparedness um, aspect of it. Um, so I'll talk more about uh, stressors. Um, some of um, my recent learning has really come from the Governor's um, Council on Climate Change. On um, I'm participating on some of the subcommittees for that. And also um, some of the team, uh, there's some in the audience here who um, worked on, we worked on a grant together um, that paired health equity and climate challenges. Um, so I just wanna, I wanna say, um, I was glad to hear JR call out that um, the pandemic would also be considered as part of a natural disaster. Um, I'd also like to say another disaster that we're dealing right, with right now or long-term stressor is um, the history of racism. And so both of those, um, the, I, I guess what the pandemic as a shock really laid bare some of the inequities. So I think, you know, as problems, um, you know, whatever solutions we look towards in um, disaster response and recovery really needs to take a lens of understanding that it really impacts people differently. Um, so that that's just, I, I think it's important to um, just put that out there, um, even though, you know, we have many kind of human made, um, disasters and stressors, we have to acknowledge them in prep in preparation ideas for a natural disaster. Um, so I think w one of the things we talked a lot about in this um, grant exercise with Laura's on here and Maya's on here, and there's a few more people that participated in that, um, is really the importance of including um, affected communities in sort of vulnerability assessments and vulnerability um, mapping. And so I see that um, we, we also talked about some different kinds of technology that might be, um, could be used um, so that people can really measure, understand the place that they're in, the issues that impact the kind of stressors that impact their neighborhood and how that might, um, you know, shape a climate response, basically. Um, we had focused more on sort of long-term mitigation rather than the disaster response, but I think it's also, it's really important to include um, everyone's experience in sort of mapping out vulnerability. And I think that's challenging. It's easier to map kind of to sort of overlay FEMA flood maps and, you know, populations and population census data, and you can get kind of this macro data, but then really getting sort of lived experience is important. Um, and then specific, um, let's see, specific, so, th so that was, that's one thing that I've been thinking a lot. And, you know, as in the planning profession, I think many are thinking about how do you um, really include this kind of micro um, data um, from affected populations and have them also have a voice in prioritizing what the perceived risks are. 
Um, so I, I, I think that this was brought up in the problems, but obviously people have vastly different um, resources to respond. Um, in New Haven, one of the, um, we have a CRS program, which um, is a FEMA program um, that if we, and what it basically do, does is it offers an insurance reduction um, for you know homeowners based on a certain number of steps that the city takes. Um, but the CRS, um, some of those uh, flood insurance um, programs do not address renters. So that's another um, thing to think about and was brought up in the um, initial, you know, in the, in the problem statement is um, somebody who, the, the options after a disaster for somebody who has, who owns a home, who has insurance are vastly different from a renter. Um, so the, so equity is like really important. Um, I would also um, put mental health into this. Um, so a lot of, you know, this, the way we can reach people and um, make them feel safe in a disaster is really important. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm not, I don't have a tech background, so I don't really, I, I'm not providing any possible solutions to that, but that's just a consideration. Um, and then finally, like very specific to um, New Haven, I would, you know, think about areas like um, like River Street, like English Station, they sort of have these triple threats of being contaminated and being um, at in the floodplain and also being, um, you know, having a economic or an environmental justice impact on the neighboring communities. And I would say those are what some of our like extreme challenges um, when thinking about potential floods or um, coastal flooding. Um, there's a lot of, um, somebody brought up heat, that's definitely an issue for New Haven and there's been some great studies done um, on that in New Haven. Um, that's definitely one of our, our risks as well as cold and, and having, um, you know, heat security in the winter time. So continuation of, I guess, energy is gonna be a big issue. So um, those are just some ideas that I wanted to throw out there. JR, I don't wanna take up too much time. I think there's a lot of awesome brain power in this room. So I just, I wanted to just throw out the, um, I guess, you know, whatever tools we propose, just understand that, um, you know, disasters impact people very differently and how can we have tools that are nuanced enough to, you know, be effective in that way. Um, so I'll, I'll just wrap it up with that. Great. Well, thank you. And uh, you'll be, we're going to move on to solutions. And I think as a, uh, you'll be here as a resource. And if we have questions, perhaps about, uh, at least from your perspective at the city, we can, uh, we can draw on you as a resource. Okay, great. So now what I want to do is I want to do 20 second uh, or less so it, I'll be timekeeper here. Uh, read out of the best solution that you came up with. Uh, you, whatever your favorite one is that you want to present. And I'm gonna try and capture these. So uh, just one at a time, and we wanna go through everybody before repeating any one person. Uh, I'm open to whoever wants to go first. I'll give it a try. All right, <laughs> brave first one. Okay, so um, the notion of information being available in the right place to make decisions, I would suggest a um, community coord uh, coordinator captain on like every block, someone who's designated, where they can be a radio wireless radio, battery operated, report a whole bunch of parameters into a central uh, receiving 
uh, aggregating system so that a lot of information can be put in, not relying on cell towers or, um, or even um, internet routers. So um, that would be, uh, so for uh, on the street communicators who can report what they see in here in a structured format. I'm done, that's it. Great, no, you did a nice job of keeping it tidy. Um, and looks like we have one uh, written here from Jay. Uh, whenever the compliance data for any metric is used, ensure that we have data scraping uh, 10K 10 Q reports. I don't know what those are, but to assure that we are receiving data from markets vested in protecting their financial interests. Um, so uh, I guess I'm not quite sure how to summarize that as a statement, but um, we'll keep processing that if somebody wants to jump in with theirs. Watch the money. All right, I'll put watch the money. And crazy is encouraged here. It does not have to be a great one. And you are going, there's going to be ones that are actually already being implemented. It's okay if you do not um, do not know it's implemented. You shouldn't be shy. Sure. So, JR, I'm happy to talk uh, as sure. usual. <laughs> so, I've done a bunch of things that sort of hedge on, um, I think, this grant uh, mission. But the one I'll choose is uh, decentralized healthcare information systems. Um, so hospital information systems tend to be ultra centralized, uh, not focused on individual uh, health care or individual metrics necessarily, and also don't necessarily take into account um, social issues. So sanitation you have in your house, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera, whether you have a communication line for emergencies and so on. Um, so these reporting systems, especially in a time of pandemic, when you have lockdowns and quarantines and things like that, if people have a machine that's decentralized, uh, that can talk to other uh, network devices um, and report those metrics, I think it's really valuable both for a civic standpoint, but also for people to um, be empowered personally. Um, they won't have to feel, for example, that they have to go into a hospital to risk their health um, just to report information about their current health status. Great. Awesome. And I'm writing these down and gathering them. And I'm going to put them in a chart so everybody can see them. Uh, in fact, I'll share that now as we are uh, working so that you can get a sense of where this is going. So here I have the uh the different domains where they think solutions are going to be and i'm dropping our uh our solutions into these spheres uh to try and get a sense of the landscape of the types of things that we're thinking about and we can keep adding to it if we have a lot of ideas we can consolidate and uh keep keep going that way so uh and do we have any other ideas? I'll jump in, JR. Um, sure. Like what uh, Aisha was saying about um, learn, like identifying, the, letting the, the vulnerable communities identify the threats. Um, and it's kind of simple. And I know there's like ways in which we do this already, but like um, essentially just some sort of effective way of collecting survey data from residents um, and maybe it's something that like you're able to gather much more over the course of a year rather than like doing it every five years or something um, and so it can be a bit more responsive to um, the needs and I don't know if that's like an app or a, um, yeah I don't, I don't quite know where technology fits in there yet but some effect really effective way to Get it. So I'm, I'm going to call that uh, micro. It sounded like you were saying like throw. Maybe it's not micro, but it's like quick survey data, right? Yeah. 
quick, like high that's quantity. My, that's my summary. And so, uh, where do you think this goes on the chart? Um, maybe. Uh, I'm thinking between data and creative, sort of right here. Yeah, vulnerable people, civic engagement. Yeah, yeah. So the let me uh, describe the way I'm envisioning the chart. So the spheres are the blue, uh, each identified by the blue boxes. So it's sensors, creative innovations, and data, and analysis. And then the context that has to be integrated into all of the solutions, so that it's, they're not exclusive of any of them, are thinking about civic engagement, how this can be tested in a pilot, uh, how this helps vulnerable people, and how this uh, is implemented in low-income communities. So that's the context that has to be integrated into all of them. Yeah. Uh, other ideas, just things you wrote down. D give me the, give me the, the whatever you wrote down that's crazy. So I think something else, uh, and this may not be what they're looking for, but I like, I think that the flow, the flow of information in the other direction is also really important. Uh, so some way of communicating with people, so from the center outwards, um, so some some sort of signage or, or communication that could be used to broadly communicate to people. Say like if the cell towers are down, then. Uh, texting everyone over the, the normal emergency communication method might not work. But if there were a little screens around that could flash messages, then that could be a way to communicate to people what they needed to know. Yeah. Uh, so this is um, civic critical uh, info displays. Is that a fair headline. And I'm going to put that I'm going to put that in in the sensor devices area. Because that seems like you'd be building devices. And uh, did we have a did we have another one come in on chat? Um, so if a food distribution uh, network to for res resilient food system. All right, so I'm going to put um, food network and creative innovations and uh, small green power generators at the local level. And so I'm going to put that in devices. It's kind of between devices and creative in my mind. So um, small power generation. All right. And then I had... Uh, does anyone else have one? I did have a right in one that was uh, somebody who's going to show up later. Um, my dream would be to have uh, the harbor with reef balls to fight erosion, clean the harbor, and uh, buy valve growth and attenuate wave damage which gives the, um, given the forecast for this year and climate change will be increasingly necessary as hurricanes intensif intensify, plus would bolster uh, for education programming and so on. So the recommendation would be um, reef balls for erosion. And so we might, we might just take that, which doesn't uh, seem like it fits, but now we can incorporate the data elements. So reef, Balls. Um, all right, we're getting we're getting to a point where we can probably move to the next uh, the next stage. I'm going to say uh, I would like to do something. We've been talking about this long range IoT uh, work. I'm going to say, uh, and if we have lots of little sensors, one thing we have talked about is better understanding of the flow of the sewer system so that it will, uh, a cheaper sensor, so that we can really understand when there's overflowing into our rivers and so on. So I'm gonna say um, uh, stormwater monitoring.
JR, could we throw one more in there? Yeah. I dumped a lot into the chat, um, and there's more oh. I can think of off the top of my head. But the one that I think is most important is understanding flow of people, um, because I think that fits into a lot of scenarios. And we don't have a good ex understanding of, of how crowds move in New Haven um, at all right now. So uh, privacy respecting crowd counter, um, which obviously you know I've worked a little bit on. So, Sure. Uh, so I put understanding how people move in data and analysis. And if somebody who has uh, an unmute, uh, because I'm doing a few things, if you can help me identify anybody who wrote in and hasn't been represented in the chat, um, feel free to jump in and, and help make sure everybody else is heard. I'm not trying to avoid people. Oh, controlled flooding is interesting. All right. Um, controlled flooding heat mitigation. And I'm going to put it over here. All right, was, was there any others as you guys look back, uh, local sourcing? All right, I think we can move on to the, the next stage unless there are uh, any others that I missed. All right, seems like, seems like we might be okay to move on to the next one. Well, I, I'm gonna bring this back up, but the, the next uh, stage is for me to uh, get these polls populated. So I'm going to copy these over and there's going to be a poll for each one of these. So for sensor data, uh, I'm going to, so you can start um, going to uh, makehaven.org slash poll slash devices. And in a minute, there will be, um, the options will be ahead and we'll see what is the most popular. my there it is okay so devices and uh if anybody in the devices category wants to speak to their why don't you guys make a pitch uh real quick for whatever solution you want why people should vote for you and then I'll have a vote up. All right. So if people go to polls dot um, or makehaven.org slash poll slash device, it's on the uh, I'll put it in the chat. All right. So makehaven.org so pulled it in another tab, and we'll start seeing which ones are people's favorites. Feel free to lobby as we are uh, as we are working. Should we just uh, talk? Yeah, just just talk. That's okay. It. I don't want to dominate discussions, so if, if anybody wants me to shut up, I'm happy. <laughs> but, um, okay, so uh, as far as uh, counting crowds goes and, and flow of people, um, traditional solutions in cities, uh, smart city plans and so on, have uh, severe privacy issues. Uh, they use technologies like facial surveillance, which is um, awful for communities with people of color. Um, extremely biased, obviously track a lot of information that people find downright creepy. Um, so I'd like to propose a system that um, tracks the movement of people, counts people in crowds, but does not look at demographic information or a personal uh, PII style information to do so. 
um, and still can tell us, for example, um, you know, which bridges are most popular for pedestrians to cross, which sidewalks people are using um, in times of emergencies, where people may be congregating, where crowds might be outside of storefronts, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and this sort of system would use either Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or a combination of those technologies, but it could also use different camera technologies as long as those camera technologies had a privacy, privacy by design system. Um, so for example, they block out faces automatically, um, they turn the contrast way up and only look at silhouettes of bodies instead of looking at them as people and so on. Anyone else want to speak to a, an idea, one that they have? You should be seeing the data. I, I'm broadcasting, I believe, the results. I, I don't know uh, how I can vote for what I'm thinking, that the uh, population should be enabled with uh, battery-operated uh, handheld radio transmitter receivers. And yeah, so that's in the creative intervention. I'm putting that in the creative interventions. Um, so it'll be in that one. Okay, I, I I don't see it. I don't even know how to get to it. Yeah, actually. we're not voting on it yet. So it'll be up next. Oh, oh, we're not. Yeah. So I think we're gonna close the. Uh, it won't be up next. The analysis will be up next. All right. So looks like the displays are the most popular at this moment. That doesn't mean we're locked into that. It just means that's where we're gonna start the conversation when we go into the group work. So. Uh, I am adding that over there. So now what we're gonna go to is the second poll, which I will share, and that is makehaven.org slash poll slash data. I'll share that in the chat as well. And then I will share that screen. And anyone who has a uh, one in the data poll, so we have three that I put up there, um, feel free to speak on behalf, convince people why to vote for your, uh, your one as the favorite. The thing I said before was actually in this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. At, at the top there, thank you. to speak. Uh, it'll take me just a minute because I'm setting up the other poll. So as you vote. Page not found. Oh, really? Uh, I can share this. Well, other people seem to be finding it. Those votes are coming in. All right. So uh, the looks like we're doing understanding how people move is the first topic of conversation in the data analysis. And so the last poll is going to be at uh, makehaven.org slash poll slash creative. And I will put that in the chat. And this one unintentionally is a big one. It's uh, if there's multiple winners, we can break into multiple groups. So there's, you know, feel free to to vote. And this is uh, this is where you can make the case for these ones.
I'll make the case for controlled flooding. Um, Do it. Yeah, there's a lot of areas in the city that have issues that, that are in the floodplain and have are at high risk for flood events. And those areas happen ha, have a high correlation with the areas that have very low street tree coverage and very low green areas in their in their in their sidewalks and their streets. Um, controlled flooding is a is a difficult thing to pull off, but something that when done well can be a very effective way to sort of mitigate flooding in a way that sort of beautifies in a natural and innovative manner. Um, and perhaps could somehow be used in conjunction with more green space to sort of create sort of a drive in the community towards uh, making a more sort of green and uh, heat trapping uh, streetscape. Cool. Anyone else want to speak for theirs? Yep, I will. So sure. uh, on block radio captains, I mean, I, that that's just one aspect of having a network of networks. In other words, where a person having one of these uh, very $10 radios can choose any one of 16 networks to log into and, and either report or ask for information or help. Yeah, there could be one on every block for the people who don't have radios. But uh, a wireless battery operated radio allows communication over distances when the power systems are down, when the cell towers aren't working, when the routers are not working. So it, it's actually more reliable and more fault, fault tolerant than all those other uh, technological solutions. That's my opinion. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, so it looks like, um, Although recognized, you know, a, a couple of them here, that the first topic that people want to talk about is the uh, controlled flooding heat mitigation. So uh, our, uh, the results are in. Um, and so in the sensor, so what I want to do is I want to break into some uh, groups. There'll be uh, four groups, the three by these areas, Plus, there'll be one wild card. So if you're you know you're unhappy and you want to talk uh, first about radios or you just want to socialize, um, that, that is the, the wild card group. Um, but I'm going to try and direct the majority of people to first talk about these, understanding that the topic can change and, and move on. So we have uh, sensors and devices talking about uh, civic critical info displays. We have data and analysis algorithms talking about understanding how people move. And we have creative interventions talking about controlled flooding for heat mitigation. And uh, I'm gonna give you guys a little while to talk. And what I'm gonna have you do is break out into a separate Google Hangout. This Hangout will be whoever shows up. People can move around and they are going to be at different URLs. Uh, in the group, I want you to uh, pick somebody who will write some things down. Uh, and I want you to write, answer these questions because at the end, I'm also gonna ask you to have somebody to come back and do a 90 second pitch telling us about the idea and the results of your brainstorming in your group uh, in about 90 seconds. And in those 90 seconds, I want you to cover the what the problem is very specifically, the solution, and I encourage, if it helps to draw something, I find that often can be great. You can use Google Draw, you can use Notepad and share your screen, whatever you want to do. Uh, the ultimate vision and goals of that pilot project, um, The uh, what is the learning that you hope to get? What is the hypothesis and what do you think the results will be? Uh, partners that you would need to get involved uh, in order to make it successful. And then stepping back, those broader impacts. How is this impacting uh, the community and the world in the way that we we want. Uh, to get to these rooms, you're going to go makehaven.org slash and then room one, room two, room three. Uh, that should redirect you to a Google Hangout where you can uh, where you can talk and just self sort. I will uh, I'll give you about 25 minutes. So we'll be convening at uh, five. 20, you know, 525. And 
please go and break out into your uh, breakout groups. Remember to write these down and be ready to pitch to the group. You'll return here to do your pitch. All right, I think we are uh, close to complete. Um, so the uh, next step is to do 90 second uh, pitches that go through the key points. So I'll put the key points that we talked about on there. And uh, after your pitch, uh, what we'll do is, I actually made this document so you can all edit the document yourselves. And uh, if you are at a point where you think it's one of you wants to be uh, a leader on one of these topics, uh, wants to continue to recruit and get people from outside this or work with some of the people that are here, uh, it will be, uh, you'll be able to add the team information right here inside the uh, right side the inside the document. So that's what's going to follow the pitches. And then I'll just end with some logistical things of if you want to submit how that happens. Uh, so I'm going to go back to to pitches. And why don't we have our first um, our first team pitch? We'll do uh, we'll do sensors and devices. So go ahead and take us through it, whoever the designated sensor and devices person is. Yeah, I can do, I can do that. Um, we talked about a lot of things. Um, I always feel like I end up going in like multiple directions rather than <laughs> settling on one thing when I do these exercises. Um, but I guess I'll talk about one. Um, yeah, and everyone else feel free to jump in. But uh, um, brought up the issue of traffic monitoring. Um, currently um, is expensive and um, not all that fine grained. So it's like the two rubber pipes that go across the street. Um, they'll let you know when a car goes by, but like they're expensive to set up. You can only put them in a few areas. They're not telling you if pedestrians are using that area, if bicyclists are using that area. Um, so the solution would be to explore ways to do that more effectively. Um, and uh, yeah, the, like the vision and goals and the broader impact on society would be thinking about um, transportation around the city in a disaster. Um, so it would be collecting the data ahead of time about what areas are most accessible by foot, uh, by bike, and because um, uh, those are going to be some of the most reliable routes during a disaster. Um, and so getting a good handle on that before the disaster strikes um, is will be useful. Do you have a, a question that you want to test or uh, partners that you were thinking would be recruited to this endeavor? We hadn't quite gotten to that yet. Um, I would think the question would be, um, are there any yeah, you know, what are the big problem areas around the city for pedestrians and bicyclists? What, um, where are people not able to get 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 around? Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think partners would be cities, uh, the city, the folks doing the transportation planning. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I know like local school districts might be interested to know um, how students can walk to school, what routes are available for them. Um. Cool. All right, well, let's um, let's jump over to the, we, we'll do a Q&A at the end um, where we can ask questions, but let's jump over to the creative uh, interventions, which was the street flooding for heat mitigation. You guys have somebody who wants to do a quick pitch on that? Sure, I'll talk. Um, so the problem that we, was sort of two problems, that both there's a lot of uh, low-income neighborhoods that have high, that have problems of extreme heat, and on the other hand, that they, the, a lot of those neighborhoods are also neighborhoods where there's high flood risk. So the solution was that basically um, designated channels on streets that could absorb a certain amount of, amount of rainfall, but at a certain point they would also um, 
have the, the water would flow through them. Um, and the, the channels themselves would be places for sort of beautification of the street. You could sort of have green infrastructure that added some kind of character. Uh, the water would be stored in some container where it could, um, during extreme heat events, flow back into the street as a sort of uh, cooling mechanism. Uh, it could also, the water, while it's being stored, could be used in creative ways in the neighborhood for, as a cooling system for buildings or for essential services in different ways. It could also, potentially, that water could be cleaned and used for drinking water or for like splash pads or things like that in parks. Um, as a result of the pilot, a million dollars, we could probably in, implement this in one neighborhood, for example, the Mill River neighborhood. Um, it could be taken in a certain set of streets, a certain container, and we could do some experiments with cooling. The hypothesis is just to test whether this is a tenable thing of what the best practices are with this kind of cooling technology, whether it's possible at all, whether it's a waste of time. Partners could include um, Yale School of the Environment, who I'm sure would be interested in this kind of project, uh, the city engineering department, and then, of course, uh, Make Haven could help with, you know, developing containers and that kind of technology, as well as um, the CID at Yale, which is another makerspace. Gather New Haven would probably be interested in developing the green space. And the broader impacts on society would be that, you know, it's always good to invest in infrastructure. It's good for the economy of the area, which is an area that the city is trying to uh, develop. As well, there's a lot of schools on that in that area, in the Mill River area, that, um, of course, would learn from the green technology about ways to develop in an environmentally conscious way. Uh, great. Thank you. Good pitch. I think we will move on to uh, Rich, and then we'll end with Sean. So, uh, Rich, you, you had the uh, social wild card one, and I think you wanted to develop a pitch. Okay. Am I, uh, can people hear me? Yep. Uh, okay. So, the problem that uh, I want to address is uh, the fact that there's no power, the cell phones are down, all the internet routers are down, and the people are unable to communicate anyway except by in person so with a, a very inexpensive i don't know if you can see this or not but this is a uh, ten dollar uh, uh radio transmitter receiver with 16 channels on it and with uh, a bunch of these in the community and um and uh, some equipment on the roof there could be 16 networks uh that one network might be information. What network should I go on to report this or to get this kind of help? But you, they'd be able to simply turn the switch to the network they want to go on and uh, sign in, log in, and then somebody will uh, talk to them and there'll be a lot of people listening. Some of these networks might only be listen networks where there's just public announcements coming across. But the nice thing is that these radios can be charged in a car or they could be charged if you have AC power, they could be charged here and they could be left on while they're being charging. This is a communication system that was actually enabled by the Federal Communication Commission. There's uh, two bands that you can use. It's called the FRS band and the other one is the GMRS band. You don't have to know anything about it. All you got to do is have these radios programmed, take them, to, we would, it'd be easy to program them and and so the vision would be that uh, people can communicate, ask for help, report information. Um, the learning is what will we do with the system when there is no emergency? Because it would be there. We would have drills. Uh, Brenda is a um, operates radio networks quite regularly, and there's a protocol for how to talk on them, how to join them, how to use them. Uh, what partners are to be involved? I think the police department, the fire department, emergency uh, medical. Uh, services, uh, food people, everybody could have somebody monitoring uh, for, um, to make, uh, for instance, go to channel three and put in a 911 call to the local uh, emergency services of the police department, do that with one of these radios. Um, or in a, when you're, it's not an emergency, the, it could be a neighborhood watch where everybody in a building can communicate with each other or everybody on a block can communicate with each other. Uh, this, this, uh, these radio frequencies were set up for exactly for this purpose, but no one seems to be doing it. And I think we could do it. I think we could en enable communications 
in the civilian population for a very small amount of money. The big problem will be is organizing the networks and how they're used and training people how to get on and off of them. And it's not hard. Uh, so anyway, that was my pitch strictly for the purpose of emergency and later on neighborhood watch situations. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. And finally, uh, your pitch, Sean. Sure. So I did the uh, data analysis algorithm solutions, understanding how people move. And I also, before I get started, I just realized I'm logged in as my organization privacy, privacy safe. Um, so anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Sean O'Brien. And I believe I can show my camera. Great. Um, so cities have an incomplete understanding of the movements of their population. Um, knowing where people walk, where they congregate, and other metrics of pedestrian traffic, um, that's vital for a more equitable allocation of resources, um, as well as designing for safety. Um, inadequacy is highlighted during times of crisis, emergency response, et cetera. Uh, you know, this has a big impact on it. Uh, and the current smart city solutions that tend to be implemented uh, meet that problem through tracking individuals in great detail. Um, so they use technology that might be very detailed, such as facial recognition, um, and there's a large expense to personal privacy there. Um, this expense is felt most by communities of color um, and generally speaking, um, disadvantaged communities in general. Um, so, you know, um, undocumented workers and so on. So uh, how do we fix this? What's the solution? Well, small single board computers, such as Raspberry Pis and Beagle boards, they can be utilized to count people without tracking them as individuals or risking their privacy. What do I mean by that? Well, you can use Bluetooth uh, or BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy, Wi-Fi, other sensors, LiDAR, infrared, and so on, um, to detect someone crossing a street, um, moving from one side of a bridge to another, um, and seeing the size of crowds. So for example, knowing how many people are congregating on one area of the green um, at a specific time. Uh, and that data can be enriched with privacy by design cameras. Um, so cameras that use blurring and pixelation of faces or silhouettes of bodies, um, other ways to obfuscate identity. And then those devices can report to each other via IoT networks across the city. Um, so LoRaWAN, maybe traditional Wi-Fi networks, maybe wired networks. Um, there's a lot of options there. Um, the vision and goals, uh, what would we do in a pilot project? Uh, well, we'd deploy these IoT appliances around New Haven. We'd focus on known points of entry to pedestrian traffic areas. So I'm thinking downtown crossing. I'm thinking, you know, areas like where the food carts are and Long Wharf and so on. Um, and these devices will track pedestrian traffic flow. Um, they'll display that information via a web dashboard. And that dashboard will be available to the city um, and other civic organizations. Uh, money will be allocated towards computer hardware, software development, wireless access points, and improvement of the system. Uh, what questions will it answer? Well, the pilot will give more accurate and holistic understanding of pedestrian traffic patterns, um, how many people are downtown at a specific time, which infrastructure needs to be improved, um, if additional pedestrian safety measures have to be added, um, and how much footfall is occurring in front of storefronts, which is really valuable for local businesses. Um, Partners in this can be City of New Haven, Town Green District, Yale, Gateway, um, Southern, pretty much anybody who wants to, um, who is a vital part of the New Haven, um, you know, urban landscape. And uh, the broader impacts, well, the impacts are pretty broad in general. If you don't understand where your people are moving, which areas need improvement because they're being utilized, um, you know, which parks are high capacity, uh, what weekends um, are, uh, you know, a big deal downtown, which ones aren't, um, then you can't even give an accurate view to uh, developers who may want to develop in your city. You certainly can't give data to storefronts and business owners about pedestrian footfall and how much traffic they can expect. Um, and that has a huge economic impact. I, I think more so than that, uh, successful cities are cities where um, uh, there is walkable infrastructure. And having that kind of infrastructure, I think we all want more of, but first we need to understand, you know, where the choke points are and which areas need the most attention. JR? JR, you're muted. You've been muted this whole time. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you. I okay. too many buttons. Uh, thank, so thank you all for uh, uh, working through this uh, these problems. Um, were there questions that you had for each other that uh, you want to put out there or comments on the pitches you saw from other people? Uh, I think that that's something that I saw, and I, I think Aisha posted it uh, in the chat at some point. And I don't really know if this ties into the competition. It looks like the chat is raised. Um, but I think that uh, distributed food generation, like having more urban gardens, is something that I'd be really excited about. Um, so if that could tie into the um, into this competition, then I'd certainly be excited to pursue that. Great, and that, that might be something that comes out of if other people here are interested. Um, so I wanna talk about, it's just if you are pursuing one of these, what does it, it look like? So the next step for a team, if formed, would be to go through this set of questions that I have uh, outlined. I pulled this, I, these are kind of a summary of what's in the uh, application process. Uh, and it uses some you know, confusing terms that you like, intellectual merit uh, and you know the, the methods and the broader impacts. So I've made an effort to summarize these as clearly as I can, uh, but you would go get together, talk as a team uh, about answering all of these questions in a general way. And then you would go and uh, produce a six page paper according to their specific instructions. So. It is limited to six pages. Uh, and I think if you looked at that list of general questions or topics, you could pretty easily uh, fill six pages on these various ideas. And uh, following these instructions, you would need to submit. Uh, I will uh, give you a tip that it's the, the process of submitting through the National Science Foundation, even though this track is meant to be as simple as possible, uh, there's some obstacles. So it needs to be a nonprofit civic partner that's submitting it and or, or a government partner, either either one. Um, and they need to have a SAM account, which takes a little bit of time to apply. It's a go general government ID account. They need to have a Dunnis number and they then register on research.gov and through research.gov, they can go through the process of the specific questions and submitting. I have not gotten all the way to into the research.gov process. I only have gotten through the, uh, the initial qualification steps. So give some time, leave days in advance uh, in order to submit it. This is, they want these submissions in uh, before July 1st. So you have a short time period. If you're motiv motivated, I'm sure you can pull together a, uh, six page paper in that time and and i i really hope you do so i have created a, a tab here called team formation uh, i made this document editable by everyone in the in the call everyone has a link to the document that was shared and i'll reshare it and i would encourage you to put your contact information your names uh in there so that you can connect with each other uh, if you can do it better through chat or some other um, through some other method, that would also be a uh, a way to go about getting in touch with each other. But that concludes the formality of walking through the process and uh, showing you the path to submit one of these innovations. Any closing questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Uh, could you just post the, the link to the presentation in the chat again? Yep, I will do that right now. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to say if anybody would like to uh, have a discussion about the 16 networks that the public can hook into with a wireless radio and, and use in an emergency purpose, um, you can find me in the, the general meet room on Monday nights and Tuesday nights uh, at Makehaven between five o'clock and six o'clock.
I'll just make a quick plug to, um, I work for Save the Sound, uh, so we're an environmental nonprofit. Uh, we're in New Haven and around Long Island Sound. Um, so um, I'll keep an eye on this team formation and see if um, you think about ideas of my own. But yeah, if anyone, the like the the green infrastructure for cooling uh, idea, I like that really cool. So if anyone is pursuing or interested in um, projects that relate to the environment or water quality, um, feel free to let me in. Great. And the Connecticut Fund for the Environment would be a uh, great partner on, on civic partner on many of these types of uh, activities. Save the sound now. It's our official name. Oh. I'm sorry. Save the sound. <laughs> great. Well, uh, I hope you enjoy it. And thank you all again for, I know it's a two hour block, so it's a significant chunk of time. And I know it's a race through a lot of content. Uh, if uh, you know anyone else who would be interested in this, I am recording it and the slides are available. So, um, you know, perhaps there's other teams that will form after the fact as well. Uh, but thank you for coming. Thank you for participating and for your ideas. This uh, concludes the formal session. Thanks, sure.